Okay, it's always good to have you there around. So <clears throat> the talk has three parts, and I hope I will have time to finish it all. So the first part is uh, a joint work with Zivbar Yosef and Sabrina Rashid from, uh, from, CMX, from CMU. So here are three, parts, three facts about uh, the human genome, okay? It, has, it is two meters long, it has three billion base pairs, and it has about, this is a rough number, about 2,000 genes in it. 20. Sorry, 20,000 uh, genes. So how do you take two matters and condense it and put it into the nucleus of a single cell? So here is the basic structure. You take the, uh, the double helix DNA, you wrap it around a protein which is called histone. So those are the histones. You wrap it around about, uh, never mind how many, about 200 base pairs around each histone. Then you take the histone, put them together. What you get is you get the, what is called the chromatin fiber. Then you take the chromatin fiber, condense it even more, and then put it, it fits into the nucleus of a single uh, cell. So we're going to come back to that in a minute. So if I have two different cells, suppose I have a neuron cell and a skin cell, how come they are different given that they have exactly the same genome, exactly the same DNA? So in all our cells, basically 200 cell, different types of cells, we have exactly the same genome. How come, how come the cells are different? And the answer is, of course, if you look at a, if, at a gene, it can be in one of two states. It's either on or off. So the genes that are on in a, this type of cells are different from the genes that are on in this type of cell. Okay, so this is what makes those two cells different. The, the, the genes that are on, okay? So how do we turn genes on and off? That's the next question, okay? So first, what it means to be on and off for a gene? It's just one bit, okay? So let's assume that this is the DNA, right? It wraps around the histones, and this is the, let's assume that the red one here is a gene. So we say that the, this uh, gene is in an off state if the, gene, the uh, chromatin is very condensed and there is no access to this gene. So you cannot access it, you cannot replicate it, you cannot do anything with it, it's off. And on the other hand, this gene here is on, it's turned on because you can access it. So basically what you want, if you want to go from this situation, you want to turn this, to turn on this gene, you want to activate it, you have to move from this state of the chromatin to this state. And vice versa, if you want to turn it off, you have to move to the other direction. Okay, so here is another picture that says the same story. So here is the chromatin, the whole thing that we described in before. Here you have the a gene which is on because it is accessible. It's not the whole story. It's a necessary condition for it to be accessible. It's not always sufficient condition. There is something which is called DNA methylation, but we are not going to deal with it. We're going just to say that it is accessible, so it is turned on. And this gene here is turned off. Okay, so, this, so now we know what, what it means for a gene to be on and off. And we would like to understand what is the process of turning a gene on and off? Let me just tell you that, you know, turning a gene on and off, it's thing that happens in your body all the time, every day. So as a result of a di your diet, stress, exposure to pollution, your genes are turning on and off all the time. So it's not something that happened in your childhood, it happens all the time. And how, the question is, what happens? What makes it, how do you do it? So let's look at this picture again. It's the chromatin over here. And this is just what I called, uh, here you have the double helix DNA, right? It wraps around the histone. The whole thing here is called the nucleosome, but the names are not so important. Okay, and if I look at the histone here, there are something which is called histone tails. Histone tails are those uh, tails that you have in here. And there are proteins that are floating around and they can leave marks on the histone tail. So a protein can come, touch this tail over here and leave a mark on it. So now let's change terminology to computer science terminology. Now you can think about this nucleosome over here as a cell, or as a memory location. Now you have a memory location and when you want to write something into this memory location, there is a protein that comes and leave a mark in here, it's like writing some value. When it leaves a mark over here, it's a different value. So you can think about it as a memory location. And we can now start to try to model this whole thing 
in the models that we are familiar with and can define a problem and, and solve it there and understand better what's going on. Okay? So basically, there are three types of proteins. And maybe from now on, I will call those proteins processes. So this is the, when I try to model things, then we move from proteins to processes. So we have the writers, the erasers. So the writers are the proteins. You have different types of them. But those are the proteins that can actually leave marks on the histone tails over here. You have the erasers. The erasers can come, and if they see a mark over here, they can just erase it. And then you have the readers, and the readers basically just look around and see what is going on. So the readers are the executors, and from our point of view, they're not interesting because we don't care, I mean, what happens. We just want to understand, you know, how, how to turn genes on and off because it involves some coordination problem. Okay? Now, just to make sure that, uh, that we understand it, writers, erasers, and readers are a terminology of biologists. It's not something that I'm inventing. Okay, Bio biologists call them writers and erasers. Okay, and we're going to use the same names. <laughs> so here is the first abstraction. <coughs> okay, instead of looking, there are many types of writers. We are going to concentrate on two of them, and we're going to call them one writers. Those are the, bl the blue ones over here, one writers and zero writers. So we have two processes, two types of processes, zero ri one writer and zero processes, and we have two types of erasers. Zero erasers, those erasers can erase zero marks, and uh, one erasers can erase one marks. Okay, so this is the first abstraction, and following the biology assumptions, this is all based on, we model things, we have the biology assumptions and we try to model things. So if you have a state, the state of this, let's call it a memory location, or nucleosome, so the state of this memory location, if it's zero, it's not possible for one writer for one writer to arrive and change this zero from, just change the state from a zero to one. It has to go in this way. First, a zero eraser has to erase the zero mark. So now it's empty, there's no marks at all, and then the one writer can come and write one. Okay, so it's a very weak operation. It's not, not like the, 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 the atomic register, atomic read-write register. <coughs> you have to go through this stage of erasing <coughs> things before you can write a new thing. Okay, so this is the first step and the first abstraction. From here on, I think everything is new. I just gave you some background. So you have all those proteins, you know, those four types of proteins. They are floating around, and they try to, like the writers try to write. So at some point, you, you might have the one writer succeed to write into those locations and the zero writer write into those locations. So you have a mess, okay? Now... How do you turn genes on and off? And this is the most important thing to understand. How do you turn them on and off? And remember, you have lots of those nucleosomes. So when you want to you know, make space for, to, to turn a, a gene from off to on, you have to make space for it, right? So you, you, have to, you have to expose it. But you have to move millions of other nucleosomes from the way in order to make space for it to open up. Right, so the way that it works is, and this is, comes from biology. This is not something that we are inventing. What happens is that if you want, let's say that you want to take this stretch of the DNA and condense it. The only way that it will happen, in, if eventually it will be written in all this stretch one. So initially it might be that, you know, those ones write one in here and zeros write, as I said before, zeros in here. But eventually, in order to condense it, you have to converge into a state in which you write one, that, that is, there are the one writer write a one marker in all those cells, and only, only then those, you know, uh, uh, nucleosomes will get together and close up, and if there are genes over here, they will change the state from off to on, and vice versa. If you want to open up this part, you have to write zero in all of them, at the same time. Only then some magic will happen and it will open up. Okay, and the question is, there is a coordination problem here, right? You can see it. How eventually you converge to a situation where you have all those locations with the same value? That is, what we're asking is, what is the algorithm that each one of them, you know, is running, and should be a very simple algorithm, what is the algorithm that each one of those four types is running so that you can converge eventually? Okay, so here is another descript description of this problem. 
very informally. So now we have an array of memory locations. So the memory location, as I said, are those just modeling those uh, nucleosomes. So you have those memory locations, and you have two teams, the team that tries to write one in here and the team that tries to write zero in here. So those one writer try to write one in here, and the zero erasers are helping them. They're going to erase all the zeros in order to make room for the ones. And they are competing with the zeros. So the zero writers try to write uh, uh, zero in here, and the one right, uh, sorry, and the one erasers try to erase all the ones so that the zeros can write their name here, there. And what we want is, by def the definition of the problem, is that if one group is larger than the other, it, larger enough means ratio of three to one or more, three to one of more, and so if the ratio is three to one of more, we want to eventually, with high probability, to converge to the same value here. So if this group is bigger, three to one, then eventually we will find one in here. Okay, and we want to, to understand, and we want to, so now we modeled it as distributed computing shared memory problem, now we want to solve it, and it will give us some understanding of how biology works. But the model has to fit all the biology assumptions. So what's interesting here is, the solution is interesting, but it, what is even more interesting is the model, which is very weak. So what are the assumptions about the model? You, you always need to assume randomization, so all the algorithms are, you know, randomized algorithm, biology, you have to have randomization there. <coughs> Processes are always anonymous, so you have those tiny proteins that are running around, they don't have names, right? But the more interesting stuff is that the memory is also anonymous. You know, if you look at this array, you don't have a memory location which, is, which you can name X, and you can say, I will write to X five, and you will, Nir will read the five from there. And we agree on the name, so I know that I have to write to X, and Nir knows that he needs to go to X and read from there, and we a priori agree what X means. So the memory is also anonymous, and I'm going to speak about this in the second part. And the processes are memoryless. Those little proteins, you cannot assume that they have memory. So, well, we assume that they have maybe one or two bits, just to model some randomization issues, but they don't, in reality, they do not have uh, uh, any memory. And as I said, the operations are very, very weak. You don't have a transition. A transition from zero to one cannot happen there is a space here that I have to delete. Okay. So a transition from zero to one cannot uh, occur directly. You have to erase first, right? So it's a very weak model. And there's no sense of direction. We cannot understand. We cannot agree a priori which side is left, which side is right. And uh, we want a symmetric solution that will not favor one of the values. So we don't know in advance which group is bigger than the other. And uh, Sebastian will like that, everything has to be self-stabilizing and, and stuff like that. So once you solve it, you see that the solution is not that difficult, but it takes time to get to a simple solution, right? Okay, so I'm not going to show you a solution, but the only thing that I'm going to uh, say that uh, uh, I'm interested in the model basically, but we present an algorithm with a, which match all the biological assumptions and derive uh, some bound on the expected runtime, both theoretically and in simulation, and I think it's, it's a very nice result. You can read the paper, it's not available yet, but probably next week it's, you can find it if you search for the name. And, but the main thing for this talk is that, look at the model, it's a very weak model, and my first conclusion for, for this talk is going to be for the first part, is going to be conclusion number one is, anybody can guess? Okay, that weak models are interesting also from a practical point of view. So the fact that the memory is in a line that what is important. It gives you some information, but right. It's not completely anonymous in some sense, but it's anonymous in partially anonymous. Okay. So now I'm going to focus on one aspect of the model, which is the anonymous shared memory. And my second part is going to be Oops, my second part is going to, the title of the second part is Anonymous Shared Memory. I'm going to explain what I mean by anonymous and just give you a taste of the results that you can prove in this, in this, uh, well, in this technical uh, environment. Okay, so what is the classical shared memory, mo shared memory model? We have those processes, right? You have the processes and you have the memory. 
and the memory always have names. So this guy can write to X, and this guy, I will pick a nice color for near, so, so near can actually read from X, but we agree on X a priori. This is the basic assumption. Okay, and what it means to do to have an anonymous shared memory? It means that we don't have those names. We don't have those names. So each process can actually name the object or the registers, whatever you call them, separately. So this red guy can, get, can call this one one, two, six, and so forth. This one gives another set of names. This one gives another set of names. You can even assume that there is an adversary that actually gives the name to the processes. So it works against you. And the first question to ask is, can you do something in this model? So when I thought about it initially, so I called this paper, this paper was presented, uh, I presented this model first in, uh, in POTSI, and this is the name of the paper, but the first question that I asked myself was, what can you do? Can you do something interesting in this model? Otherwise, there's no point in showing it, okay? So from now on, everything that I'm saying assume deterministic algorithms, okay? No randomization. So the results that I'm going to mention are for deterministic algorithms. Okay, so the just... The previous model was even weaker because even the red process could not be understand that it's the same cell that is writing again and again. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. Okay, so... Okay, so just to give you a taste of, uh, of the results from this paper, just a few results, that's uh, just a few of them. So I looked at certain problems, classical problem, mutual exclusion, consensus that we looked at, you know, in the last few talks, renaming, and for those two problems, consensus is renaming, I managed to get uh, algorithms and lower bounds, so there are upper bounds, which is basically algorithms, and lower bounds. And mutual exclusion was more interesting. Mutual exclusion, for those who are not from computer science, is just designing a lock. Uh, I don't have time to actually define the problem, but, uh, but anyway, it's an interesting basic problem. And, we, I, and I showed that for two processes, right, if you want to do, solve the problem for two processes only, very simple, only for two processes, then you can do it if the number of anonymous registers, the model now is read-write registers. So if the number of registers is odd, you can solve the problem for two processes. If the number is even, you cannot solve the problem. Basically, you cannot break symmetry, okay? So once you have that, there are two open, interesting open questions here. The, one, the first is, this is solution for those who know uh, mutual exclusion. The first question is, can you do the same for starvation-free mutual exclusion? So up to now, it's an open problem whether you can solve two process mutual exclusion and satisfy starvation freedom. And the other more interesting question was, okay, I know how to do it for two processes, but I don't know how to do it for three processes. I thought about it for a long time, I couldn't solve it, okay? So luckily I have very smart co-authors, and very recently we solved this problem. So the co-authors are Zahara and Damian, Michel, Philippe, and this is a new result, unpublished result. So again, we are in this model, and we know how to do it for two processes. We have tight bounds, and we want to extend it to something which covers uh, uh, any number of processes. So the, the theorem, and I'm just going to read it, I'm not going to uh, focus on it too much. The theorem says that for every, for every n, where n is the number of processes, there is a symmetric deadlock free mutual exclusion. I'm not going to define symmetric, but just skip it if it bothers you. So there is a mutual exclusion algorithm for n processes using m anonymous read-write registers if and only if for every positive integer between k between 1 to n, m, the number of registers that I'm using, and k are relatively prime. So this actually solved the problem. I think it's a, it's a very nice result, very uh, a new result. And moreover, the interesting stuff is that this is for read-write registers, right? You can only, you can, you can do read atomically, you can do write, but you cannot do both. The interesting stuff is that if I, let's assume the case where m equals, equals one, because this is, a, this is a special case. So the interesting thing is that even if I give you the strongest operations possible, read, modify, write, in one single step, you can actually go to a memory location, see the values there, compute some function on it, and write in one atomic step, it doesn't help you. 
The same result, the same theorem holds even if I change read registers here to read modify write registers. This is just to give you a feel of the result. Okay, so one more slide on results. This is another new result. It's not in this paper. It's, again, an unpublished result, a new result. And, uh, and we move to the next, uh, to, the, to, the last, uh, to the last part. So the result here is, it's especially for Ellie, actually. So here are two open problems. <coughs> Where is Ellie? Okay. So here are two open problems. <coughs> you didn't ask me anything so far. Ellie. I'm not allowed to. No. You're saying that you actually, you actually do what he tells you to do, huh? Okay, good. Okay, so here are two, you know, open problems for some time. The first question is, are atomic read-write registers the weakest type of objects? Can we find something which is weaker? And the, the second question, though to, they are related questions. So are deterministic, oblivious objects with the same set consensus number, so we already heard about set consensus numbers before, with the same set consensus number have the same computational power? So I'm not going to define oblivious objects, but all the objects that you heard so far and all the interesting objects that people ever looked at are oblivious objects, okay? So this is the interesting type of objects when we focus on deterministic objects, okay? So those are two uh, questions, and now I'm, I have to say it slowly because the result that I'm going to show you is only, only for a model for universe which include anonymous objects. So you can have both anonymous and non-anonymous objects. But the results that I'm going to tell you now, I don't know the answer when you have only non-anonymous objects, okay? Which is an interesting, very interesting question. Okay, so in this case, the answer is, for both questions, is no. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that you can do about, a lot of stuff that you can do about uh, about uh, memory, anonymous memory, lots of results, lots of open, open problems, and I encourage you to look at the, at the few papers that are already around and, and try to solve it. Okay, good, so I have time. The boss tell me that I have time, so. No, I said perfect timing, it's over. It's over, okay. <laughs> no, I started late. Give me five minutes, Rashid. Okay, so my second conclusion, my second conclusion is, is this one, weak models are interesting also from, also from a theoretical point of view. Okay, so let's do it fast, the, last, the third uh, part. And I want to speak about fractions. Okay, so what we're doing now about, what is the history of fractions? So fractions were studied by Egyptian mathematicians around uh, 1600 BC. However, fractions, were, <coughs> as we use them today, didn't exist in Europe until the 17th century, right? So. Egypt's, Egyptians looked at them here. In Europe, we know about them over here. What about distributed computing? When fractions will arrive to distributed computing? What do I mean by that question? Okay, so let's look at the, all the basic notions that we have in distributed computing. We have processes, we have failures, fault tolerance. We never speak about half a process. We never speak about half a, half a queue, 0 0.5 stack. We never say, you know, 2.8 failures. Now, is it because the two might be, might be meaningless? So is it because it's meaningless, or maybe we are like Europeans before the 17th century? And let's be more specific. Let's look at this question. <laughs> we, we understand what it means for, to tolerate one process failure, but what does it, what does it mean to tolerate uh, 0 0.8 process failures? So I'm sure that if I give you time, 15 minutes to think, you would come with a reasonable definition. If I give you another day, you, would, you might even find that it's useful for something. So let's, I wanted to, I don't have time, so I wanted to do this exercise, exercise with you and define this notion. So let's assume that we have this notion defined somehow. I will give you a reference in the next slide where you can find the reasonable and I think interesting definition of this notion. But what we can do with it. So if we look at the, if we look at the FLP result, we know that we cannot, we cannot solve consensus when you have one one fault, right? But maybe you can solve consensus when you have less than one fault. Let's call this weak failure, okay? So maybe you can solve it with one weak failure or fractional failure, what I call it, and those are synonyms. And the answer is yes, you can do it, right? If you have a proper definition of them, of what is the fractional failure, 
then you can actually it show is that. Result. If you restrict the adversary not to fail all the messages, you see the, the mistake is thinking about processor. If you think of uh, adversary as failing I don't messages, have... Okay, I, I'm, I'm not going even to comment. Rashid will decide whether he give me time to answer. This is not a new result. So, okay. So, uh, I, this whole thing is this result and this whole area is defined in this paper, weak failures definition that, I, uh, that was presented in the uh, 90s, uh, uh, last 90, 90s. And let me just mention one more result and I'm, I'm done. Okay, one more slide. So, two more slides actually. So another motivation is, let's assume I'm too pushy, Rashid. Okay, let's skip to the next slide. One, one more slide, okay? So this, is, this result is with uh, Anais uh, Duran, Michelle Reynal, and uh, which was presented very recently, and it says the following. We looked at few problems, and we looked at the problem in which we know that you can do it with three processes, but with T processes, with F processes, but not with F plus one. Let's Let's assume that f is equal to 3. So you know that you can do that. And then we show that you can actually replace this one process failure with two weak failures. That is, we prove that one failure like this, this is the standard failure, equals two weak failures. Then you, continue, you can continue the process and replace this one and replace this one. And now you have a trade-off. You as a programmer can say, okay, I don't... This, this solution is more interesting for me than this solution, so you can actually choose. You can do something with it, okay? So since I'm speaking about weak failures, my last conclusion is that weak failures are interesting. Thank you very much.